So simple RNN cells are great, and with the general architecture of recurrence in recurrent neural networks, we are able to achieve quite a lot. But there are still some problems with simple RNN cells in general, the simple architecture. The first one is that we see unstable gradients, and that is not a surprise, right? When you think about it, the gradient, as we talked about, floats from all the way to the end of a network, and all the way to the beginning. And if you have a very long sentence, what's going to happen is that your gradients are going to get lower and lower and lower and lower. And at the end, the changes that you're going to make for the first input of the sentence are not going to help much in the network that we have for it to be effective or useful in terms of the first inputs. So what you can do for the unstable gradients is to use the normal techniques that we talked about to deal with unstable gradients in this course or you can do layer normalization. So we talked about batch normalization, but layer normalization is kind of an updated version of batch normalization. As we said in the course also, batch normalization is a bit tricky to apply to recurrent neural networks, so it's not always possible. That's why we go with layer normalization. Another problem with RNNs or simple RNN cells is that they tend to forget. So if you give it a long sentence, let's say with 40 or 50 words, it really easily forgets the beginning of the sentence. And this is the whole point of recurrent neural networks, right? To remember a whole sentence, to be able to put things into context and then do things on top of the information that is given. But if you forget the beginning of the information that was given to you, at the end, you might not be very effective in whatever task that you're working on. So for that, some new cells instead of the simple RNN cell that we just talked about is created. The first one is called LSTM and the other one is called GRU. So in this part, let's look into LSTM and GRU cells. As I said, it's very common to show different recurrent neural network cells in a diagram instead of you know having neurons all over the place. And this is how a LSTM cell would look like in a diagram. The main differences that you will see is that we have many more activation functions now all over the place. These are sigmoid activation functions. And then we have two lines that are running through it. You know, we have two inputs other than the actual input, two of two things that are inputted to the cell and two things that are passed to the next time step. So, and also we have an output, of course. So let's uh, explore what these things are. But first, um, as you see, we basically have the X, the input, Y, the output, and then we have H and C. H is, as we talked about, is a hidden state of the previous time step. And also this H is the one that we're going to pass to the next time step. But we also have C. And you can think of C as basically as the long-term memory uh, that is the addition, that is, that is the main addition of LSTMs. That C is the long-term memory of this whole network. So as you see, less things are happening to the C, uh, the information on C, and then it is being passed to the next time step because it kind of is the memory of the whole network. And then we have F, G, I, and O. So G and I were uh, flipped, so I quickly changed that. So basically we have G, I, O, and F, and these all signify different things. And then we have gates, and the gates are respectively named forget gate, input gate, and output gate. And we will talk about what those mean. But before we go further, one thing that I want you to realize is that what we had in the simple RNN cell is that this bit, basically, it's just this bit. We have the input, we have the uh, hidden state from the previous time step, we add them together, and then we put them to a hyperbolic tangent activation function. And normally we would just output this and also send it to the uh, next time step. But here we're doing a little bit more uh, calculations to you know, make sure that we still keep the long-term memory. So in here, as we said, we have gates and we have gate controllers. So these sigmoid functions are called gate controllers. So what is determined here is that how much information that we got from the input of this time step and the hidden state of the previous time step is going to be added or extracted from the long-term memory. So the long-term memory is the rock star, the superstar of the whole LSTM cell, and then we either add or extract things to it. And what determines this is the gate controllers. So what happens with the forget gate is that we decide which part of the long-term memory should be forgotten. Because as I said, the long-term memory is the superstar, is the rock star of this LSTM cell. So everything that we're doing here is a way to calculate 
what should be changed or what should be extracted from the long-term memory. So the forget gate is the part that tells us what part of the long-term memory should be removed that we don't need anymore. And then we have input gate and the input gate de determines what part of the new information that we've just gotten should be added to the long-term memory, should be useful in the future. And lastly, the output gate tells us which part of the long-term memory should be extracted and used to generate the output and the hidden state of this time step. So these all sound very intuitive, right? And sometimes it can generate the illusion that you need to understand why and how we forget an input and output and everything in the LSTM cell, but you don't really need to understand the full picture of all the calculations and how the forgetting and the inputting and outputting happens. Generally, what you need to know is what we talked about. There are gate controllers. They decide if something is going to be forgotten, inputted or outputted from the long-term memory. And uh, we have the general, the main uh, tract of information that is being uh, flow that flows through the input to the output. And those are the main steps of an LSTM cell. You really don't need to uh, go further than this to be able to use an LSTM cell. So the parameters that we have in LSTM cells are of course more than the ones that we have in a simple RNN cell. Uh, just to quickly go over them, we basically have eight different uh, weight mat matrices. So one of them is for the input that goes through this gate controller, uh, another one for the input that goes through this gate controller. So basically for every gate controller activation function or you want to call it uh, for every uh, activation function we have a separate weight mattress for the input and also for the hidden state that is coming from the previous time step and uh, similarly for biases for all of these uh, parts where we do some sort of calculation with the activation functions we have a different bias different set of uh, biases for that the next RNN cell we have is GRU cells. GRU cells are basically a simplified version of LSTMs, still have a similar idea of trying to remember the past more vividly, or at least not forgetting the beginning of a sequence of inputs. Um, there is no separate output in GRU cells. The hidden state equals to the output that we get, so that is one thing to uh, keep in mind. And here we also have something called R, the gate controller R, and that is basically this determines which part of the previous state will be shown to the main layer. The main layer is the one, as I said, the main information flow goes from the input through the hyperbolic tangent activation function to the output, and R determines which part of the hidden layer, as you can like follow the arrows also, is added to this main information layer. All right, so that was a lot to process about RNNs. I hope everything was clear. If you have any questions, definitely leave a comment in this lecture and let me know. Uh, before we go into seeing how to implement them, let's talk about why they are better. Uh, so we, I already mentioned that here and there in this lecture, basically the reason that we use RNNs instead of a neural network and normal neural networks is that they have this, they keep the sequential dependency that we have in between features or words of a sentence or any kind of pieces of information in the same data point. And that is a very important, um, relational information to keep in mind, especially for sequence data or time series data. And on top of that, they are able to um, adapt or they are able to tolerate different lengths of information. So you do not have to set the length of your uh, input beforehand. It, uh, they are able to work with sequences of arbitrary length. Okay, these are all good and all, but what kind of tasks can we use them for? The first one is we can use them for uh, time series data, as I said, this can be uh, stock prices or it can be energy usage of a city. Uh, you know, there could be some seasonality in there that basically it will probably depend on you know, how much energy I use today would depend on the energy I use the day before, maybe the day before also. So there is going to be some um, dependencies or relationships between these pieces of information. So that's why RNNs would be a really good choice to uh, deal with these kind of data sets or uh, deal with these kind of patterns. Next we have natural language, of course, sentences, words, books, articles. These are very good examples of data sets to work with RNNs and also audio files. So if you like, for example, I'm recording right now and if you look at the file that I've recorded, you know, we're always going to see these um, um, 
lines that are wiggly lines that are showing you what you said and RNNs are actually quite good to work with audio files and analyze them or do some sort of uh, generation even. All right, the next thing that we're going to do now is to learn how to implement them on Keras. So let's jump to that.